Pastor Brad was preaching a few weeks ago about the rich young ruler. And in that text, eventually the ruler decides that what he has is more important than what he's been offered by Jesus. And so he goes away sad. And the followers of Jesus say, man, it, th this is crazy. Uh, because Jesus' comment on the situation is, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. And the disciples are like, man, th 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 then how, how's anybody gonna get saved? And Jesus responds and he says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. When the angel was speaking to Mary that she was going to conceive our Savior, a situation which, you know, is completely impossible for a, virg a virgin to be with child, the Spirit of God was going to come over her and conceive in her the Son of God. And in the moment, the end of this conversation, just six words in verse 37 of Luke chapter 1, for nothing is impossible with God. Paul writing in Ephesians 3.20, a text that is very well known to people who are in church and probably has been, you know, held on to and clung to by a lot of us in life. It says, now to him, speaking of God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. For nothing is impossible with God. And I wanna ask God in these moments to plant seeds in our heart of possibility. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you're up against. I don't know what the situation is, but I do know that we're with a God today in his house who is the God of the impossible. And that's the title I've given this message today, God of the impossible. I was inspired uh, in this talk on Monday when Shelley and I and Brad and Brittany were in London taking a short trip to Oxford on our way to a meeting uh, outside of the city of London. And I knew going to London on Friday that my friend Andy Stanley was also going to London on Friday. We, we had texted about it. A friend had said, hey, I think Andy's going to London. I was like, hey, we're going to London. So I texted him, said, you going to London? He said, yeah, we're going Friday. I said, great, we're going Friday. He says, well, we don't have to be anywhere until Wednesday or Tuesday, don't remember. So we're free all weekend. I said, great, maybe we'll get to see each other. And he's like, that'd be awesome. So we get there Friday and we, we've got stuff going right away. Saturday, we have a schedule that's kind of hit or miss and we're, we're, we're not really sure where we're gonna be when Sunday comes and goes and now it's Monday morning and we're getting ready to go on this train to Oxford. Brad is being Brad. He's got nine options for trains. We can go on the 915, we can go on the 1020. We, uh, I, no, no, I found another one that's cheaper at 1040 or we can go at 1045. Are you all ready to go right now? We could get on the 905 and we're just all trying to have breakfast and Brad's over here working and three websites trying to buy tickets to go on a train to Oxford because we have a few hours to be there and enjoy that incredible city before we go to this meeting that we're headed to about, about 45 minutes away. And so eventually we, we, we landing on the 1020, but I'm at the table thinking, this is terrible that we haven't seen Andy and Sandra yet. They've been here, we've been here. Maybe they think we don't want to see him. I don't know. We, we, we didn't, it just didn't work out. And so I'm trying to formulate the text like, hey, I'm sorry that we've been here for you know, a weekend together. We haven't seen each other, but our schedule's been a little bit all over the map. And I'm trying to work on that text when Brad says, come on, everybody, we got to go now. We're getting on the 1020. Up from the table we go. We grab our stuff. We're getting a taxi. We go to the train station. We're getting on the 1020. So Brad's got the tickets. He's worked it all out. He's got all the stuff on his phone. So we're all scanning 
through the little turnstile. Uh, the train leaves at 10.20. If you've been to England, you don't get to trains that leave at 10.20 until about 10.18. So we're arriving at the train, and we, we get on. We can't find our car, but we know we got to get on. So we just get on, and we start walking through cars, you know, looking for the car we're supposed to be in. And we know we're in car D, and we have a certain number of seats. And so we're, we're just kind of looking, and I'm heading the pack going up the aisle. There's some more people got on late, and they're coming down the aisle. We got a little commotion going on. And I look up, and Andy and Sandra Stanley are sitting in the two seats by the window right. on a four-top table in the upper-class car. Now, if you've been in one of these cars, there's four tops and two tops. And so on the two-top side are no people. On the four-top side where Andy and Sandra are sitting is Andy and Sandra, and then no people. And they're like, hey, and we're like, hey. And then Brad says, oh, these are our seats. <laughs> the two seats at the four-top table with Andy and Sandra are our seats. Right here. <laughs> we can't believe it. We, we, we're an hour and five minutes or whatever it is on this train together, having the best time catching up on life. And the whole time, Andy's kind of like looking at me like, like, really, where are your seats? Because there were a lot of empty seats in this car. He's like, I, I know that it's cool that we're on the same train, ran into each other, but you know, like, where are your seats? So we got to Oxford and we all went to lunch together. And then we all walked to uh, do Addison's Walk together because that's what they wanted to do. They had a few hours there also before they were going a different direction to another thing. And so now we're doing the walk together, the C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien walk together. And the whole time, he's like, now, were those really your seats? <laughs> I mean, some of you understand Andy, right? You go to his church also, and so you understand his <laughs> mindset and, the, you know, the way that works. And um, it's always my favorite line. <laughs> Gets him every time. You're like, you know that. Yes, yes, we know that. We talked about it on the train. We we're all on board. Everybody's up to speed. And, and he's like, for real. And so finally, I have to get Brad to pull the tickets up on his phone and show them, yes, these are our seats. Because we can't believe it. What are the odds? Super low probability <laughs> that two best friends growing up are going to get on the 1020 and somebody who doesn't even know they're going to Oxford, none of us knew they were going to Oxford. We didn't know anything about that day, bought the tickets right next to them. Either Brad is punking me on this whole thing, <laughs> which I didn't even think to ask you until right now. <laughs> Please don't ruin one of the greatest moments of my life. swear you didn't know. <laughs> swear to God. <laughs> and so we're walking around, we're having the best time because it's rare that we really have a few hours where we're just enjoying life, surprise moment. And I'm telling you, it just blew our mind. Shelly and I have had a year like this. We, we've had a year of divine appointments like this that have been so improbable. We, we had another one in London, but they're improbable, not impossible. Yeah, impossible would have been, we're in a taxi cab in Phoenix and Andy and Sandra are going on a train to Oxford and we ended up sitting next to each other. <laughs> That's impossible. And maybe in your mind right now, what you're looking at is improbable, but more likely it's impossible. But God is the God 
of the impossible. And you may be in a section of life where the melody feels a little janky right now, a little off key, but you're still in a divine symphony of God's redemption story. I want to take us today to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He had an assignment from God to bring a message that really wasn't all that welcome to God's people. God's people had forsaken his ways and judgment was coming theirs. And Jeremiah was the prophet to announce the plans of God. But he comes in chapter 29, verse 11, to a verse that a lot of us memorized when we were kids and have held onto all of our lives. Does anyone know Jeremiah 29, 11? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. A lot of us have held on to this promise. We've we believed in it. We've made a foundation stone out of it in our lives. But interestingly, most people in church do not know the context of this verse. And in God's word and in God's economy, context is everything. And so when we see the context, it actually isn't going to lower our confidence in God. It's going to raise our confidence in God, but it's going to explain some things, not everything, but a few things. The context of Jeremiah 29 as a whole is that by this time in the, in the life of God's people, some of the best of the best have already been taken into captivity in Babylon. They're already exiles from their own land. And we read about the stories of some of these, the brightest and the best in other places in scripture. And Jeremiah is writing a letter to them in captivity. And to them in captivity, he writes these words. We'll just pick it up in verse 10. You can read the whole chapter if you want to see the context in full. If you're not sure, verse 1, we'll give that to you. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So we pick it up in verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So the message, God of the impossible, just to be clear today, is not a message of escapism. It isn't a, oh, this is going to become our bumper sticker slogan for everything in life. Oh, I believe in God. I believe God can change everything. I believe God can turn stories around. I believe God has a future for me. I believe I'm not defined by my failure, but it's, just, it's, it's not a setback. It's a setup. And, 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 and a lot of things that are true, but can become slogan-esque in the kingdom. This is not a message of escapism. There is loss in life on a broken planet. Amen. And in our lives, there is loss. In this room, there is loss. But even in the loss, God is working a redemption story. 
In 586, Jerusalem completely falls. But God has a plan that cannot be thwarted. So the first point of this message today is no matter what your season, your story can end in restoration. Because God is the God of the impossible. And you may be in Babylon today, but God still has a plan that cannot be thwarted. The second interesting twist in this story, we see in chapter 32. And in chapter 32, not only are the best of the best already in Babylon, but Nebuchadnezzar is building a siege wall to the city. If, you, if you've been in the Holy Land or traveled in the Middle East, you understand how this process works. But when, when one army would attack another, people would retreat into a very fortified city. The gates would be closed and there really wouldn't be any way in unless you wanted to spend years of time breaking through walls that were 10 or 20 feet thick. And so what the advancing army would do is build a siege ramp. In other words, they would just start collecting rocks in the wilderness and build a ramp and continue to build it 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 it until they could go up that ramp and over the wall and then take the city. Because the people have nowhere to go, they're trapped in the city. And in this context of chapter 32, Nebuchadnezzar, is close to finishing the siege ramp. And so the end for the city of Jerusalem is near. And that's the context that we pick up in verse one. It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Now, this is the phrase that you you hear all the way through this book, by the way, this is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah. So it's good that we're in church today because we need to get back to that place in life where our ears are attuned to the word of the Lord, where it's commonplace for us to hear the word of the Lord, where as we're moving and navigating life, we're like, oh, but then the word of the Lord came to me. Oh, I was in that moment, but the word of the Lord came to me. I was in a very difficult situation, but the word of the Lord came to me. It didn't look like there was a way out, but the word of the Lord came to me. I didn't know what to do, but then, the word of the Lord came to me. All our conversations are, I didn't know what to do, so I called so-and-so, Googled it online, looked for an article, reached out to a friend. We gotta get back to that place where our ears are attuned to the word of God. And we know in moments throughout the day, right now, oh, the word of the Lord came to me now. This is what the word was that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. The army of the king of Babylon was then besieging Jerusalem and Jeremiah the prophet was confined in the courtyard of the guard in the royal palace of Judah. Why? Verse three, now Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him there saying, why do you prophesy as you do? Why are you prophesying all this destruction on my kingdom? Why are you prophesying that God is gonna turn his people around, but the way he's gonna turn his people around isn't gonna be that awesome? I don't wanna hear this anymore, so I'm gonna imprison you in the courtyard of the royal palace in Judah because I don't wanna hear from you anymore. Meanwhile, Nebuchadnezzar siege ramp is almost to the top of the wall. This is where we are. But then notice a few verses down in verse six. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, Son of Shalom, your uncle is going to come to you and say, buy my field at Anatoth. Because as nearest relative, it is your right and duty 
to buy it. Now you're like, okay, this, this is again, Louis, why I don't read my Bible. Um, I don't know who these people are. I don't know anything about what's going on here. It's just too much for me right now. I've got a lot going on in life to get my head around like what is happening in the history of my people. Verse eight, then just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, buy my field at Anatoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right to redeem it and possess it, buy it for yourself. Okay, that's like the train to Oxford, right? The Lord spoke to me and said, your cousin's going to come and he wants you to buy this particular field uh, and it's your right and duty to buy it because he's your uncle, it's your family. And just as he said that, my uncle came in and said, I want you to buy this field because it's your right and duty to buy it. I think that's what walking with God is supposed to look like. And so... He says, I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Duh. <laughs> so I bought the field at Anatoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed, had it witnessed and weighed out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave this deed to Baruch, son of Neriah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel and of the witnesses who had signed the deed and all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. In their presence, I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Take these documents, both the sealed and unsealed copies of the deed of purchase and put them in a clay jar so they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. And here's what God says. Are you ready? Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. What belief that God is the God of the impossible. And then that's what he prayed. So let's see part of his prayer and then we'll come back and understand what God is saying to us. After he'd given the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, thank you, Neriah, it's Father's Day, so we're getting you in there as many times as we can. Happy Father's Day. I pray to the Lord. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, you show love to descendants, but bring the punishment of their father's sins into the laps of their children after them. That just means the collateral of poor father decisions domino down into the generations. But then look at God. Oh, great and powerful God, whose name is the Lord Almighty. Great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to all the ways of men. Verse 20, you performed miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued them to this day, both in Israel and among all mankind and have gained the renown that is still yours. Verse 24, see how the seed ramps are built up to take the city because of the sword, famine, and plague. The city will be handed over to the Babylonians who are attacking it. What you said has happened as you now see. 
And though the city will be handed over to the Babylonians, you, O sovereign Lord, say to me, buy the field with silver and have the transaction witnessed. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. And then he goes on to say, the Babylonians are coming. And then he explains all the reasons why as he comes down through the rest of this chapter. But just jump ahead, if you can, to verse 38. They will be my people. This is what God's ultimate plan is going to be. I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them and I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. This is what the Lord says as I have brought all this great calamity on this people, so I will give them all the prosperity I have promised them. Once more, fields will be bought in this land, which you say, quote, is a desolate waste without men or animals, for it has been handed over to the Babylonians. No, verse 44, fields will be bought for silver and deeds will be signed, sealed and witnessed in the territory of Benjamin in the villages around Jerusalem, in the towns of Judah, in the towns of the hill country, in the western foothills and of the Negev, because I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. So what is God saying? The second point of this message today is God is saying that I'm the God of the impossible, so stand on your corner in faith. Take a position of faith on your corner. And Jeremiah said, I believe you. I believe that your plans are for good and not to harm us, to give us a hope in a future, I believe you so much that even though the army is at the top of the siege ramp and the city is going to be overrun, I am going to take my money and buy that field. I'm going to do the deal in public so that everybody can see I believe in the faithfulness of God. I'm going to put the deeds sealed and unsealed in a jar that is sturdy and firm so that it will be intact in time when God comes through on his promise, there will be my deed for the land that I purchase. Because I'm telling you, Nebuchadnezzar isn't going to honor my deed. Armies are coming over the wall and going to burn the city. And this whole thing's going to be a wipeout. And nobody's going to say, well, Jeremiah, congratulations. We're going to let you keep your little plot of land in Anathoth that you bought. No, but there's going to be a day when God's going to do what God said he's going to do. And when God does what he said he's going to do, I'm going to have a deed in a clay jar. They said, I believed in God. It's called the fight of faith. We've talked about it here so much, but I'll never forget the moment going into the end of 2020, uh, uh, of 2020, thinking there's no way we're doing Passion 2021 in January. It has to be online. Everybody and their brother has gotten sick of being online. Every speaker, every band, every artist, everybody you know, every TV show has been online. Everything's been virtual. Everything's been digital. Everything has been Zoom and nobody wants any more Zoom. So, you know, heaven forbid that we do a digital version of passion. This is around Thanksgiving. And God says, as clearly as I can hear his voice, where where is your corner? I said, well, for all these decades, our corner has been the first few days of January, inviting university age young people to come and see what it means to live their lives for the glory of God. And I remember sensing him saying, go stand on your corner. Well, I guess six weeks until our corner. 
He goes, it's digital. And something like 700 plus thousand people came to Passion 2021. Because we stood on our corner. God provided all the finance for it like two weeks before it happened. So we could offer it for free to everyone on planet Earth. And this has been our story. That's why we're in Atlanta, Georgia today, right here and right now. My dad's disability and eventual death brought my wife and I out of Texas where we were seeing God do the impossible into Georgia. And without that step, there is no passion that, that I'm aware of. And then Shelly sensing God saying, passion has taken us around the world, but God wants us to bring it home to our city. And this church is born. Go stand on your corner. And then I've told the story so many times about this year. It's May, we, we have zero money in conference accounts. We've refunded every ticket that we've sold in the last year and a half. We have no idea what the landscape is for the world. And the Benz comes to us and says, we've got these dates. Do you want them? We're like, well, let's see. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I have no idea when the next surge is coming. We're in the, about to go into the worst one that we've had so far right after we made this decision in May. It takes way longer than this to do something of this magnitude. Our team has shifted. People are not even here that were here before. Our partners have all shifted. We call on the phone. Hey, calling Tom there, college pastor. Oh, he didn't work here anymore. Oh, great. You have a new college pastor? No, we haven't. I got a new college pastor. He has the pandemic. But God, just go stand on your corner. Put it in a clay jar so that when I do it, you can go back and say, we believed. But here's the most beautiful part. It's not the size of your faith. It's the object of your faith. If I brought a little wickety chair that I'd gotten at an antique store from 1803 that had one cracked leg and the back looked like it was a little wobbly. And I said, here, we just got this new chair. Uh, it's uh, 200 years old. Have a seat. You'd be like, okay, easy and end of this one. <laughs> Creaking. But if I had another chair that I just bought had sturdy looking big feet down on the floor. It was big and round and cushy and comfortable. And it was, you know, of, of mass. And I said, hey, come on and have a seat. You would never ever think about the chair. You just sit down. Over here, you're like sizing the chair up. You're putting one hand down. You're seeing if it can hold a little bit of weight. And now you're kind of easing down, but you got an exit plan in your mind. Like if this thing goes down, I'm going up. And you're, you're, you're checking it out. It's not really about the size of your faith is about the object of your faith. And I guess all God's really saying today is, how big is your chair? Right. So big. Huge. Is it big enough to sit in when the siege ramp is at the top of the wall? Because see, God had a plan. Right now it's just Nebuchadnezzar. He's got all the power. You read through history, somebody's got the power. But then you keep reading, they're gone. Somebody else has the power. Oh, they got the power. Keep reading, they're gone. Oh, somebody else has got the power. Keep reading history, they're gone. God's still seated, they're gone. God's still seated, they're gone. God's still seated, they're gone. 
And in another place, the prophet said that Cyrus was coming out of the east. And Cyrus is going to take down Babylon. You've heard about the fall of Babylon. When Babylon falls, a God moment is going to happen. A brave person is going to speak up. Nehemiah is going to get released with a vision to rebuild the wall. The wall is going to be rebuilt. The people are going to return to Jerusalem. The city is going to be vibrant again, and God is going to be praised in Zion once again. Ultimately, Christ will be born a few miles away in Bethlehem, and in 33 years, he will return to this city to do what is impossible with men, but what is possible with God. And in the same city that Babylon is about to overthrow, when the men come over the siege ramp on the wall, the Son of Man will come into this city in another time, six centuries from now, and he will do a miracle in this city when he gives his life as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, including the ones that got you in exile in Babylon. He's covering those and the ones of the present and the ones of the future for all of humanity. A miracle is happening in the city. The ground is going to shake. The tomb is going to prove useless. Christ is going to ascend. The spirit is going to fall. The church is going to be born in this town. And praise God, Jeremiah has got a clay jar somewhere down in archaeology's history. It's got signed deeds in it. He said, I believe God is going to do what God said he's going to do. Stand on your corner in faith. But there's one last thing that I want you to see. And that is Anathoth. A-N-A-T-H-O-T-H. Where Jeremiah bought the field from his uncle. Where is Anathoth? Well, well, geographically, it's three miles northeast of Jerusalem on, on the edge of the Judean hills. But historically, it's the place Jeremiah was born. So he's buying the field of his birth. And you say, well, why is that important in this message, God of the impossible? Close by just reading these opening words from chapter one. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. What a word from the Lord. And he responds, ah, Sovereign Lord, this is the way you respond when the word of the Lord comes to you. 
I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go everywhere I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. And the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So the third point, closing with this one, you were created on purpose. for purpose. And the God of the impossible wants to take you back to your anathos today. The moment where he can speak to you, what he spoke to Jeremiah. Oh no, you're not gonna be a prophet to Zedekiah. You're not gonna be a prophet to the kings of Judah. You're not gonna pronounce that Babylon is coming to besiege the city. You're not gonna be the one who prophesies over this historical moment in the faith. But the word of the Lord needs to come to you today. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a fill in the blank to the nations. I gave you a role, I gave you a job, I gave you a purpose, I've set you on a course and that course is for good and not for evil. It's to give you a hope and a future. It's to bring you to the place where you'll call upon me and seek me with all of your heart and where you'll find me because I wanna be found by you, declares the Lord. And I wanna bring you into a good, in a spacious place. I wanna bring you into a restored life. I wanna bring you into a fulfilled vision. I wanna bring you along with what I'm doing on planet earth. And though the kingdoms rise and fall, I am restoring all things. And I want you to be a part of my restoration story. Before you were born, I already had a plan for you. I pray especially that teenagers in this gathering, wherever you are today, will hear this word today because we're losing too many of you right now. Maybe someone is telling you that you are accidental. Maybe the philosophy that's trickling in is that we all just sort of randomly showed up here on the planet. So when you're in that dark place and when you don't see the way out and when it doesn't look like there even is a God who cares, what difference does it make? But I'm telling you, there's a different story. You were not here accidentally. We did not just all randomly show up on planet Earth by some crazy low probability of a process. No, you were created. The circumstances may have been that the siege ramp was at the top of the wall, but God created you, called you, and still has a beautiful purpose for your life. So when the darkness closes in, when everything looks crazy, when it looks like God's not even on the scene, you gotta hear the word of the Lord. Before you were born, I knew you. When I formed you in the womb, I called you. Before you took your first breath, I was already inviting you into a redemption story, a restoration story. And though the city's on fire right now, it won't end that way with me. I am the God of the impossible. I pray that in this moment, 
by the power of the Spirit of God that His wind will revive hope right now. I pray in Jesus' name that by the power of the Spirit of God in this moment right now that God will redirect despair. I pray by God's Spirit right now that He will activate a courageous step and somebody will buy that field and say, I'm gonna stand on my corner until God does what God said He will do.